Do you think that someone guilty of one of the worst crimes imaginable can be rehabilitated? If so, how can you really know for sure if they've actually changed? And what happens if you're wrong? Yukio Yamaji was a very troubled boy, born into a poor, struggling family on August 21st, 1983. When he was very young, both his mother and father worked to support the family. However, his father was quite the drinker and he died from cirrhosis when Yukio was in elementary school, only 11 years old. This hit both Yukio and his mother very hard, with his mother working as only a store clerk and having to support both herself and her son it's safe to say the family was not doing very well. Yukio was also not an exceptional student. He was very often absent, not going into school in the first place. But when he did go, he often stuck to himself, talking very seldom. He had a lot of trouble interacting with the female students especially. Sometimes he would even lash out violently. Fellow students vividly remembered him smashing a window at school during class. By the time Yukio was in middle school, his mother was already in heavy debt. They often struggled to buy even the cheapest food they could find. Once Yukio graduated middle school, he made the choice not to move on to high school, with high school not being mandatory in Japan. Instead, he began working at a small local newspaper shop. Yukio would later go on to describe his life up until this point as exactly like hell. For his job, Yukio was regularly delivering newspapers all over town. While on one of his outings, he met and began seeing a much older woman. Granted, this woman was only in her 20s, but Yukio himself was only 16 at the time. Over time, their relationship became physical. However, after thinking on it for a while, the older woman decided that she wasn't very comfortable with their age gap and broke it off with him. But Yukio didn't give up. He kept pursuing her. His mother, however, strongly opposed the relationship. She began calling the woman, but just remaining silent on the line, not saying anything in that sort of cliche, creepy sort of way. Despite no words being exchanged, this was enough to enrage Yukio. Yukio decided that his mother's life needed to end. On July 29th of 2000, when he was still just 16 years old, Yukio grabbed an aluminum bat and set out to exact his revenge. He used the bat to break some glass in the room, shattering it all over the floor and terrifying his mother. Then, with a quick swing, he hit her over the head. She walked all over all of the broken glass, trying to steady herself, dazed after taking the blow. Even upon seeing this, her son did not stop. He kept hitting her to the point where he could no longer count the amount of blows. By the end, her face was unrecognizable. Now, there are some discrepancies when it comes to exactly how Yukio came in contact with the police. Some people say that it was actually his lover, the older woman, who ended up finding out about the mother and calling the cops. But more commonly, most other sources state that Yukio called the cops himself. Either way, he was arrested on July 31st, three days later, and was transferred to the family court. He plainly told the police that he felt she deserved to die due to the silent phone calls she made to his lover and due to her massive, continually growing debt. She had also insulted his father and refused to tell him exactly what her debt was even for. Eventually, the Yamaguchi family court had Yukio sent off to a reform center for minors. They concluded that the attack on his mother was an unprovoked, unplanned, spur-of-the-moment sort of heat-of-passion sort of crime. They felt that, although he lacked any apparent feelings of guilt, reform may be possible. They felt sympathy for him after hearing the story of his life. The death of his father, his financial struggles, his borderline starvation. Due to all of this, he was sentenced to stay at a juvenile detention school in Okayama. He spent his time in Okayama being pretty productive. It looked like he was actually making a great effort to change his life. He gained a number of certifications, such as in welding and hazardous materials engineering. He also worked on his mental health, where doctors found that he had an unspecified developmental disorder that prevented him from forming lasting, 
meaningful relationships. He eventually did apologize to his lawyer for the killing of his mother, but kind of ruined the apology by also stating that it could not be helped. She did not tell me what she would use her borrowed money for. So, uh, I'm sorry, but it's still her fault, but I'm sorry, sort of thing. And then, in October 2003, just three years after he killed his mother, Yukio was paroled. He was released out onto the streets to fend for himself, with no ongoing help for his mental health, no financial support whatsoever, and nobody to help him control his urges and impulses. However, he was allegedly a changed man. Allegedly. He was hoping to meet up with the older woman he had previously dated. He wasn't really sure on how to find her, but he was confident that he could, telling officers, there's a woman waiting for me once I leave here. But in the end, he couldn't find her. He didn't stop the search, though. Yukio, out of ideas and completely out of money, broke down and decided to go live with his grandmother. While living with her, she suggested that he go visit his mother's grave and pay his respects. He adamantly refused, saying, I won't go to where my mother is. Yukio had his coming-of-age ceremony where he officially became an adult. However, after that point, he vanished. Yukio became a complete ghost and flew off the radar for quite some time. We now know that during this time, he had moved on to a new city entirely and had begun hanging out around pachinko parlors a lot with pachinko parlors basically being small, legal casinos. He spent a lot of his time here hanging out with other thugs who frequented and worked at the parlors. He was able to make money through illegal means, albeit, but still never managed to have much more than the bare minimum needed to survive. When he had time, he went back to his hometown to search for that woman, but still never found her. Yukio ended up finally getting enough money to get a place to live in an area in the city of Osaka, where he lived in a block of condominiums. He was soon caught and detained by a police officer after he was caught creeping out a bunch of women by trespassing in the women's only condominiums. But he was released shortly thereafter. After two years of this, Yukio flew back onto the radar becoming quite the opposite of a ghost and committing a crime that would go on to make him famous and would go on to make the courts realize that they made a horrible mistake in ever releasing him. In the same condominium block that Yukio lived in, there was a room belonging to two sisters. These girls were named Asuka, who was 27, and Chihiro, who was 19. They never knew or really noticed Yukio, but he definitely noticed them. He took quite a liking to them, especially to the older sister, Asuka. He became captivated by her and could not get his mind off of her. The thing is, Asuka bore a strong resemblance to the older woman that Yukio used to date. He went from peeking at her, to watching her, to following her around the building, until eventually he learned what unit she lived in. Later, in November, he hatched a plan. He messed around with the power supply to the unit and caused a power outage. During this time, he did his best to find out if there were any other people besides Asuka and Chihiro living in the home. But when he did this, nobody was home. On November 17th in 2005, five years after the killing of his mother and two years after his release, he waited outside Asuka's apartment until she came home from work. When she did, he ambushed her brandishing a knife and pushing her into the apartment. Later on in the evening, when Chihiro came home, he attacked her as well. Now that he finally had the two of them together in the apartment, he began his assault. He physically forced himself on both women. And then, using his knife, he stabbed both women in the chest and face repeatedly, many times. They were stabbed so much that both of them passed away from their wounds fairly quickly. When he was done, Yukio stole whatever cash he could find, which was only about 5,000 yen, or around $50. He found Asuka's favorite lighter and decided to take it, and in the process, he decided to burn down the apartment as well. The fire was quickly spotted and reported at the condominium. 
Once the fire department was able to put out the quickly spreading flames, they went inside to find something even worse. They found the bodies of the two women, and the police were quickly on scene shortly after. It didn't take very long for suspicion to fall on Yukio. He had recently just been detained for creeping around the apartment, after all. On December 5th, a few days later, he was brought in for questioning, where he quickly confessed to both violating and killing the two women. He told the officers, I could not forget the feeling when I killed my mother and wanted to see human blood. He told them about the murder weapon, a kitchen knife that he owned, and told them that he had thrown it away at a shrine a couple of hundred meters away from the crime scene. He wasn't lying, and the cops picked it up fairly quickly. Yukio was swiftly booked and charged with double homicide. It wasn't a hard sell, as there was a wealth of evidence against him, and he had confessed to the crimes using descriptive details that only the killer would know, including the exact location of the murder weapon itself. He also still had Asuka's lighter on him, both connecting him to the fire and placing himself in the apartment. Robbery was listed as one possible motive for the crime, but Yukio's lawyers argued that it wasn't actually something that he had planned beforehand, and that taking their money was just a spur-of-the-moment sort of thing. The prosecution accused him of committing the crime for nothing more than the mere pleasure of it, but his lawyers argued that he was incapable of comprehending the difference between right and wrong at the time the crime was committed. Their assertion brought to question, was Yukio even competent to stand trial if he was that deficient? It was ordered that he undergo psychiatric testing as well as a slew of other tests, both to better understand his mental state and even his character itself. It didn't help that Yukio was frequently spouting creepy remarks in court, such as, killing humans is the same as breaking something. The lawyers received a diagnosis of Asperger's syndrome for Yukio. But the judge had already accepted other expert testimony that Yukio was actually fully confident and completely able to stand trial for his crimes. It didn't take long for the lawyers to come to realize that Yukio's case was simply unwinnable. Their main goal became securing a life sentence instead of the death penalty, but even that was an uphill battle. During the trial, the prosecutors pointed out that, although it seemed he was a changed man, after he was released from his juvenile detention school, Yukio became a criminal vagrant, moving from place to place, ripping people off, and stealing money from pachinko parlors. They next presented a mountain of evidence against him. It was suspected that Yukio had planned on living off of the money he stole from the sisters while running away from the police, not realizing that he wouldn't get an amount sufficient for that. All of the evidence together was simply overwhelming, and there was no doubt that he had committed the crimes. Yukio himself had a strong suspicion that he would be sentenced to death. Obviously, I will be sentenced to death. I'm not afraid of death he stated, frankly. His lawyers went on to lament that he has no desire to live and his feelings do not extend to the life of another person either. It will probably be impossible for him to sincerely repent from the bottom of his heart. His main attorney at the time was extremely disappointed in not being able to find even an ounce of regret or remorse within Yukio. It could have drastically improved their odds of getting a life sentence, but the guilt simply was not there. He had been difficult to communicate with from the very start, but it had gotten worse throughout the trial. He lost more and more weight, became more and more fatigued, and asked if he could just go ahead and get executed as soon as possible. The father and brother of the Uehara sisters were present during the trial, holding photos of the victims. Commenting on the length of the case, their father, Kazui Uehara, said, Which will come first, my own death or the execution? That's all I've been thinking about. I now have something to take with me to my daughters when it's my time to go. Eventually, the Osaka District Court sentenced Yukio Yamaji to death for the murder of the two women. In the end, he and his lawyers had withdrawn their appeal. They accepted the death sentence. Yukio simply didn't care to pursue it, or at least didn't have the energy to. It was a cruel and outrageous crime, 
said the judge, Masao Namiki. The defendant has not reflected on his crime, and it's unlikely that he will be rehabilitated. His criminal responsibility is too heavy. The defendant is dangerous, and he is obsessed with killing people. The victims were killed in unimaginable fear and pain, and it is inevitable to hand down capital punishment. Her opinion on Yukio was made very clear. The father of the two women spoke at a news conference after the sentencing. Executing him will never bring them back, he said, but he feels Yamaji deserves to be put to death. The ruling makes me feel justice still exists in Japan, he said. Without family, or friends, or really anybody, and even absent of any last words, Yukio remained completely silent as he made his way to the execution chamber. He never apologized for killing the two women, never gave any clear motivation, and never gave any closure aside from what was to come. Yukio Yamaji was executed by hanging alongside another murderer, a serial killer in fact, Hiroshi Maue. Yukio was the youngest person to be executed in Japan since 1972, being only 25 years old. The father of the two women, still coping with his health after suffering a stroke in the year before, heard from the media that the execution had taken place. It can be assumed that he was happy he lived long enough to see the killer of his daughters given the ultimate punishment. Once again, thank you for watching my video. If you thought this video was interesting, you'd probably also be interested in my video about the infamous Twitter killer that I made a couple months back. Dropping a like on the video really helps, and subscribe if you want to see more dark content like this. If you want to support the channel even further, I do have a Patreon account as well. And uh, speaking of which, shout out to my top patrons. Lonro, Itaya, Jewel Mavchan, Lori Tayaba, Kim Peek, Lux Alpaca, Charity, Skooky Main, Foxlicity, Jackie, Lavenderwise, and Tracer Ferguson. You guys are, as always, the best. Thank you, and good night.